Plants are all around us, and this is particularly true of Pacific Island cultures, where metalworking was not developed, where stone tools were relatively simple in their construction, and where plants ruled the day and made up most of what people used for their material culture. When we consider the evolution of Pacific Island cultures, there are four key points that I think are important to consider. The first of these is that Pacific Island cultures have developed through a long series of migrations and that most of these migrations have generally happened from the western part of the Pacific towards the eastern part of the Pacific. So we find the older colonizations in the west and the newer colonizations in the east for the most part. The second is that there's evidence of relationships between the current cultures that can be found in common languages and the pattern of distribution of related languages between the toolkits that people use and the food plants that are used, as well as other kinds of plants. Thirdly, the populating of the more isolated islands, including Tahiti, uh, Hawaii, Aotearoa, and Rapa Nui, represents one of the greatest achievements of human history in that to get to these islands required traveling over extended uh, sections of open ocean without the aid of modern navigation equipment. Fourth, and, and probably most important, is that plants played key roles in the success of the migration and populating of the Pacific Islands. And that without the plants that people brought along with them, they would not have been able to successfully colonize the islands. And there's some basic reasons why this is the case. In a nutshell, the Pacific Islands don't have very many plants that are useful for food. And so without bringing along plants that could be grown as food, people would have starved. This map illustrates the earliest movements of people into uh, near Oceania or the areas of the Pacific that could have been walked to uh, during the last ice ages. Notice that people moved as far south as Tasmania and out as far as the Solomon Islands in Melanesia and into the Philippines. These early peoples brought with them a toolkit that consisted of the bow and arrow, stone and wood tools, simple canoes or rafts, and probably no domesticated plants, um, and possibly dogs being their only domesticated animal. Once these people had moved into uh, the Western Pacific, and particularly the island of New Guinea, they began to domesticate some of the crops that we now know so well. These include taro, yams, turmeric, tea, sugarcane, bananas, sago palms, Tahitian chestnuts, betel nut, the common hibiscus. However, notice that this includes no grains and this includes no legumes other than Tahitian chestnut, um, but you know, no typical legumes, no typical grasses of, or as grains. Although the first migration probably mostly happened by people walking on dry land, the second migration is characterized by people moving in canoes over the open ocean. And in fact, the, the second distribution, or the Austronesian expansion, really represents people who looked at the ocean not as a barrier, but as an opportunity or a highway. And they use this as a way to expand over a vast portion of the earth moving as far as Madagascar to the west and as far as Rapa Nui to the east and probably much further actually in both directions. Uh, there's good reason to believe that they had contact with the African continent and with the continent of South America and possibly even North America. This shows the rough distribution of Austronesian speaking communities spread over a vast area. The Austronesian language family is one of the largest groups of living languages around the earth and represents languages spoken in uh, dozens of countries. The Austronesian toolkit consisted of many of the same things as the Papuan toolkit, 
uh, with a few important additions. So in addition to the bow and arrow, there was prominent use of fishing gear, and this seems to be consistent with the ocean-oriented uh, perspective. Uh, there were stone and wood tools similar to those of the Papuans. There were complex canoes, and although we don't have an archaeological record of it, there's good reason to believe that there was a set of navigation skills that went with these complex canoes. There was the usage of pottery, and this distinctive pottery was spread early on in this migration and is one of the key markers of the rapid movements of these people. Uh, the movement of Austronesian-speaking peoples began with people who used rice and grew paper mulberry or vauke or bark to make bark cloth. Uh, both of these plants are known to have been in Taiwan when Austronesian speakers left there. In addition, these people clearly had domesticated dogs, chickens, and possibly rats, and possibly other animals, maybe even the pig. One of the key things that's important to note is that when they began their expansion, they did not have the technology of metalworking. And so this is really an expansion of a Stone Age set of technologies. Now, one important subgroup of the Austronesians who moved to the west through Indonesia uh, did pick up metalworking from other people in Asia and did develop this as a high art. As the Austronesian-speaking peoples came into contact with the earlier Papuan peoples, they learned of their crops and picked up many of them, including most of the Papuan domesticates. Uh, interestingly, most of the Austronesian-speaking peoples gave up the usage of rice and seemed to have exchanged this uh, for usage of taro and breadfruit and other crops. In addition, Austronesian-speaking people appear to have domesticated at least three and maybe four other crops. They appear to have domesticated breadfruit, giant taro, kava, and possibly coconuts. Um, coconuts are kind of an odd one in this case because it's difficult to say when they were domesticated or even if they really are domesticated today. Distributions of people into remote Oceania is easily divided into two segments. The earlier people who used distinctive forms of pottery and are known as lapida, and the later people who largely abandoned the use of the pottery and expanded much further towards the east and the north and south. The earliest people, the Lapita, appear to have had long distance trade networks where they were moving items such as basalt used in making stone tools thousands of miles across the open ocean between different outposts that they had established. This map illustrates the relative relationship between the islands of near Oceania which were secondarily colonized by um, Austronesian-speaking peoples, and the islands of remote Oceania, which were primarily colonized by Austronesian-speaking peoples. In other words, the people in the areas of near Oceania, with the except possible exception of Madagascar, uh, are now mostly secondary populations, and they're not the indigenous people. Whereas in remote Oceania, we can feel fairly confident that the peoples who are there are the indigenous people of these regions. When we consider the movements of Austronesian-speaking peoples, we can think of their movements as being in these two regions, in near Oceania and in remote Oceania. Near Oceania is the place where people developed and practiced their techniques that were later used in remote Oceania. Within near Oceania, most navigation is fairly straightforward and involves line of sight. You can see the place that you want to go to, and so you just work your way there. However, clearly people were able to develop over-the-horizon navigation skills. This probably developed early on by observing birds traveling over the horizon and knowing that these were land birds that would need to go somewhere where there's land. Could have been by seeing drift material, knowing that materials drifting on currents towards you that were land-based plant materials floating in the water must have come from a piece of land. Or by observing reflections on the bottom of clouds and knowing that certain kinds of reflections indicated that there was land below those clouds. All of these kinds of experiences would have been developed in uh, near Oceania and served very well in the future as people traveled into remote Oceania. Also, 
probably it was at this time that people developed the use of small, high-speed canoes that could travel in groups or flotillas. There's a great deal of safety by using these small canoes. Uh, if they happen to flip over, it's actually possible for a group of people to turn them back over um, because they're so small. And if something happens to one of them, it's easy for people to switch to another canoe. And, and therefore, there's safety in numbers. Travel in remote Oceania is substantially different. Almost all travel is over-the-horizon travel, meaning that you are navigating between islands that cannot be seen from each other. You have to go over the horizon and be really confident that you know what you're doing and where you're going. There's a good possibility that people learn to follow migratory birds, knowing that birds have patterns of movement and that birds come and go. In, in Hawaii, we have the kolea that travels um, to, to the islands at different times of the year in order to feed and then goes elsewhere at other times of the year. And people were able to observe that these land birds had to have a land to go to, and therefore they could follow them. In addition, people probably learned that if they got to uh, distant islands in remote Oceania, these islands oftentimes had large flightless birds that probably tasted quite good. There's good reason to believe that there was a nice reward for somebody who could find a new isolated island because then you could have a little turkey feast when you got there. In addition, finding new lands was probably beneficial. The early contact records of Europeans who explored the areas that were settled by Papuans are rather scary. Oftentimes people were attacked when they arrived and there were traditions of distrust of strangers. This probably also happened when Austronesian-speaking peoples arrived in those areas, and they had probably learned that populated areas were to be avoided if you wanted to live. Therefore, if you went into remote Oceania and you were able to find unpopulated islands, these would have been highly desirable as places of safety where you didn't have to fear that there was already a group of people present who might want to kill you. Although there were certain advantages to moving into remote Oceania, there were also certain distinct disadvantages of remote Oceania. When people arrived there, they found that there were very few large animals beyond these flightless birds. There were also very few land plants that were edible. Um, when we think about land plants, we have to consider that the plants that actually made it to these islands are largely plants that either drifted there on the ocean and therefore aren't normally adapted with fruits that are edible to people, um, or they were plants that were moved there by animals. And most of the animals that would have been moving plants were birds. And people don't happen to eat a lot of plants that birds also eat. We tend to eat the kinds of plants that are well adapted to be dis eaten and distributed by other mammals. Well, one of the few other mammals in the Pacific Islands is large fruit bats. So there are certain kinds of fruits that are distributed around the Pacific by these bats that are also edible by people. Uh, however, the things the bats like and the things people like don't always coincide. The bottom line is there wasn't a whole lot to eat in the Pacific Islands until people brought food with them. And this is what makes the toolkit that the Austronesian colonists brought with them so critical. Today, we find large supplies of edible algae on many of the coasts of islands such as in Hawaii. However, there's good reason to believe by carefully examining other islands and atolls that in the past when fish stocks would have been much higher and the fish that eat algae would have been much more dense, that there probably would have been little edible algae. And in fact, it's likely that the presence of edible algae in quantities enough to feed people wouldn't have happened until first the people modified the population of fish so that there were fewer algae eating fish present. And this probably took a while. So there, the bottom line is there may not have been enough edible algae to feed people either. However, there clearly was plenty of fish and it's probably this that sustained people when they initially arrived at an island. Uh, lots of fish, lots of big opihi, and some flightless birds. So lots of meat, very little potatoes.
as Austronesian speaking people moved across the Pacific Islands. They didn't happen to move all of the plants that they had with them. Some things got left behind. And it's interesting to consider some of the plants that were left behind. Some of the key plants that came part of the way but did not come all of the way include the sago palms, betel nut and betel leaf, and nolly nut. Three of these are large trees that take quite a few years to reach maturity. Now there were quite a few trees that did come with people that also take a while to mature, but for some reason these ones were left behind. One of the crops that was left behind is nolly or canarium. There's quite a few species of this found throughout the western Pacific. Probably their distribution is partially natural, where the species have just been distributed by animals, and partially it can be accounted for by people moving them around. In the places where these nuts are really important, they fill the role as a sacred or ceremonial plant. The trees are not cut, except on rare occasions, and they represent important cultural sites and ceremonial sites in the landscape. The nuts are an important food and may be pounded together with taro to form a kind of poi that is eaten. These trees are from the same plant family as frankincense and myrrh, and therefore they produce a resin that has a pleasant smell to them. Resin is collected and used medicinally. It's also used in making of torches that are used to light uh, houses in the evenings. A second plant that was left behind that's really important to the people who still have it is the sago palms. Sago palms are large trees that live to 15 to 20 years of age and flower only once in their life. Just before they start to flower, uh, they have large quantities of starch within their stems that are converted to sugars, and if they're cut down at that time, people can harvest these and use them as starch to make an edible flower. Uh, quite a few million people in the area of Indonesia and New Guinea and the Philippines still depend upon sago palms for their livelihood and eat these on a pretty regular basis. Secondly, the leaves of sago palms are used to make a superior thatch uh, that lasts much longer than thatch made from other sources of material such as coconut leaves or sugarcane leaves, etc. And it's surprising that this particular plant was not moved across the Pacific and there's been a lot written uh, speculating as to why this might have been the case. As plant toolkits were moved across the Pacific Islands, progressively there were fewer and fewer that were moved to subsequent islands. The result is that there's approximately a hundred species of plants that are found as plants that are used culturally in the western part of the Pacific and by the time we get to the islands of Hawaii, we're down to less than 30 of those plants that had been moved the entire way. This is really a huge loss and a winnowing of the possible uses of plants. Uh, these plants are oftentimes referred to as the canoe plants, um, and some people misunderstand this to think that these are plants that you can make canoes out of. Uh, other people think that these are plants that required a canoe to move them. Um, there's a lot of debate about exactly what the meaning is of these plants. Bottom line is this. There were plants that were moved across the Pacific Islands. Most of them that were moved were one of two things. They were either food plants that were clearly needed to maintain human populations, or they were medicinal plants that were needed to help with survival. A third category of plants that appears to have been moved is plants that are useful as construction materials. Um, and this particular group of plants that are almost all trees is actually controversial since most of these plants could have naturally distributed themselves around the Pacific Islands.